Hello, I'm David Barker, the pastor here at Central Lama Presbyterian Church. Welcome to this, the third session of our study of the book of 1 Peter. Let's open with prayer. Let's pray together. Loving God, we pray for hearts and minds that are open to the movement of your Holy Spirit, that we will hear the word that you would speak to us today, and that we would allow your word to have its way with us in transforming us more nearly into the people that you call us to be as disciples of your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, and let all God's people say, Amen. In session two, our last session, we considered the first half of chapter one. In this session, we're going to consider the second half of chapter one, verses 13 through 25. The first half that we talked about in the last session really focused on praise of God for the gifts that God gives to God's people. This session, the verses in the second half of chapter one, show how it is that as Jesus followers, we are to live in response to those gifts of God that we've received. And if you look at verse 13, the very beginning of the verse, you'll see the word therefore underscoring the relationship between the two halves of chapter 1. That what's going to follow in the verses that we're going to consider in this session is rooted in, follows from, as it were, verses 3 through 12. So if you haven't already, you may want to go back and look at verses 3 through 12 again before you continue with this. But I want to also say something about a couple of translation issues in verse 13. First of all, the phrase that the NIV translates, prepare your minds for action, literally is gird the loins of your mind. Kind of a wonderful image, isn't it? The idea of kind of hitching up your dress, as it were, and getting ready to work. The, trans the phrase, be self-controlled, literally is be sober. And this has nothing to do with not drinking alcohol. What this has to do with is sober in the sense of having all of your wits about you, of thinking straight. And the word grace more nearly in the context of verse 13 here of chapter 1, we should understand that as salvation. So that our hope, in other words, is in the promise of our salvation. All of which is to say that as Jesus followers, you and I are called to live in hope. Now, this is not a passive hope where you're just kind of sitting around waiting, hopefully, for something to happen. This is an active hope. The expectation is that we are going to be ready to work and are going to be actually involved in work, in this case, for the sake of the advancement of the kingdom, and do so thinking clearly, having all of our wits about us. And we can do this. We're empowered to do this because the hope of our salvation is secure. We can step out boldly and assertively to do this work because we don't have to be fearful that the hope in which we do it and which is sort of empowering it as it were is going to be taken away from us it is secure and the reason that we know it's secure is because in the new testament invariably when we encounter the idea of hope we're not just talking about optimism about being optimistic we're talking about confidence, specifically that we can have a confident expectation of good. And we can have that level of confidence because it's based on the work and promises of God. So the hope, in other words, is not rooted in anything that you or I do. The hope is rooted in the work and the promises of God. Look at verses 14 through 16. And specifically, let's start with verse 16, which says, For it is written, again I'm reading NIV, Be holy because I am holy. This is a quote from Leviticus. And the point of these verses, 14 through 16, is that just as we are to be hopeful people, we're also to be 
holy people. And the reason for this is very simple. We're to be holy people because a holy God, we serve a holy God, a holy God demands, requires a holy people. And being holy, being a holy people in this context involves two things. First, it involves obedience. It's an idea we're going to come back to in a minute. Obedience specifically to a new way of living. That new way of living that we're called into as followers of Jesus Christ. And that new way of living requires, number two, that we leave behind that old sinful way of living. So we encounter yet again this idea that is common throughout the New Testament, especially in the gospel, um, that in order for us to live into the new life that we have in Jesus Christ, we have to let go of that old sinful life that we were living. Verse 17, if you look at verse 17, it's a little ambiguous. Um, it's especially ambiguous if you look at it in the original Greek. But I think it's safe to say that most likely what verse 17 means is simply this, that we are to remember whom it is that we serve. That we are not serving powers and principalities, so-called powers and principalities. We are serving a holy God. And it's the same God who judges impartially of others is also going to judge us. Now this idea of judgment and of fear in the face of this judgment, this is not fear in the sense that we need to be afraid. This is fear in the sense of remaining mindful and vigilant. So we're serving a holy God. We know that that holy God is going to judge what it is that we do or we don't do. But the reality of that judgment is not something that should make us afraid where we are operating out of fear. It should simply just help us to remain mind, mindful of and vigilant about the reality that we do serve a holy God. And because we do, we are to live holy lives. Again, First Peter, adamant that we never forget that God's gifts to us come with the expectation that we're going to live our lives in a certain way by way of response. This is not to say that these are gifts with strings attached, that these are gifts that are only given if we live a certain way. That's not what this is about at all. This is simply to say that the gifts that are given as, a gra as an act of grace are nonetheless given with the expectation that it's going to result in us living our lives the way that God asks us to live them. Verses 18 and 19. Interesting verses. Let's read these. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. What these verses are doing is emphasizing the precise nature of the price that was paid for our redemption. And the price that was paid for our redemption did not involve anything which the world considers to be valuable or precious, i.e. money or material things. Our redemption was bought through the price of the life of Jesus Christ. And so these verses resonate with the whole idea of Jesus as the Paschal Lamb. That, of course, takes us back to the Passover and the Old Testament notion of um, animal sacrifice, animals being sacrificed for the sin of human beings. As we'll see, Peter sees our response to God's gift to us. And chief among those gifts is Jesus' death on the cross, is going to involve for us a Christ like suffering. Now, what does all this mean? Let's try and put this together. We receive gifts 
as people of God. And we're ready to make a list of those gifts. At the top of that list is going to be the gift of our redemption, the gift of Jesus' death on the cross and resurrection, which is what has led to um, the prom promise of salvation and eternal life, the promise of atonement, that is, that we can once again be in relationship with our Creator and the gift of redemption, that we have been redeemed from our sins. So that's at the top of this list. But in order to do that, in order for us to receive this gift, Christ suffered. And as Jesus' followers, and we find this not just in 1 Peter, but throughout the New Testament, as Jesus' followers, we too are going to suffer. Not literally in the way that Jesus did. None of us are going to be nailed to a cross and crucified. But to the extent that we live as exiles, something we've begun talking about with 1 Peter, because this is an important issue for 1 Peter, to the extent that we live as exiles, we're going to live among people and among societies that are oftentimes dismissive of and oftentimes rejecting of what we understand is the ways of the kingdom. So we necessarily are going to be living, at, living in ways at odds with which much of, what much, much of the rest of the world considers to be normal and appropriate. And that in itself is going to result in some degree, some type of suffering. So as Jesus followers, we can indeed expect that we're going to have some suffering. But in the midst of that suffering, thanks to Jesus' redemptive work on the cross, we also have hope. Because Jesus' death on the cross and resurrection reminds us that through Christ, with Christ, the suffering is not without purpose. Yes, Jesus suffered on the cross, but Jesus suffered in the cross in service to the redemption of all creation. Likewise, you and I, to the extent that we're going to experience suffering, it's not just suffering for the sake of suffering. It's suffering in service to something bigger than ourselves, which is to say suffering in service to advancement of the kingdom. Verses 20 through 21. As you read those two verses, it's difficult to not recognize that there's a resonance here with what we find out about Jesus at the very beginning of John's Gospel. That Jesus existed, was with God prior to creation. And that Jesus, in fact, was the vehicle through which all things are created and through which all things are are sustained. What's equally important in these verses is what's implicit in them. Not so explicit, but implicit. And it's this. If from the foundation of the world, Jesus was destined to redeem us, that means that from the foundation of the world, you and I were destined to be God's people. So, in other words, implicit in, what, in God's plan for redemption from the very beginning is that the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the suffering of Christ, if you will, was going to be the vehicle by which we would become this new kingdom community, that we would become God's people. And it's revealed now. And now means when First Peter was written, but also now for you and I in our, in our lives right this moment. It's revealed now for the sake of our understanding of our identity as God's people. In other words, if this was not revealed from the very beginning, made explicit from the very beginning, it's because it was going to be revealed later at a time when we were coming to terms with what it means to have an identity as God's people, as living in this kingdom community. So, verse 21 tells us, as God's people, our faith, 
and our hope are in God. Verse 22. Note how it is that we are able to leave that old sinful life behind. I think we can all agree that it is one thing to acknowledge that in order to live fully into the new life in Jesus Christ, we have to leave that old life behind, yet it's another to actually do it. What Peter is telling us here is the primary way that we do that, the primary way that we leave the old self behind to take on, to live into the new self, is through obedience. But specifically, obedience to the truth. Now, that's truth with a capital T. So this is the truth of God, the truth of the Word become flesh, the truth of Jesus saying, I am the life and the way and the truth. And one of, perhaps the first outcomes of obedience to this kind of truth, capital T truth, is love for others. This is a really, really important point. If we think about it, part of the reason that that old sinful life was the way that it was was because we tended to think about the world, what was happening, what was going on in terms of ourselves, our needs, our desires. Or even worse, we take we would take what it is that we were hearing from Jesus through scripture and we would twist it to make it about us, about ourselves as individuals, about our needs, our desires, our wants. When in point of fact, it's not. It's not about us. It's about others. So that if we are truly living into the truth and being obedient to the truth of God, the truth of Jesus Christ, that is going to result in love for others. Now, the word that the NIV translates sincere here literally means not hypocritical. So what it's telling us is that we are loving others not from a sense of obligation or self-gain, but we are loving others sacrificially. We are loving others solely because they are children of God. First Peter as a whole can, in fact, can be read as a call to community, but to a community of a specific kind, a community of love for all people. So one of the traits, one of the marks of being members of this kingdom community that we keep talking about is our love for all people. As the old hymn says, they will know we are Christians by our love. We also need to remember this is being written to exiles, Jesus followers among people not necessarily open to what they as Jesus followers are about. I mean, we talked about this in our very first session, that this letter was written to a population of exiles, of Jesus followers, of people who were living among other people who were either going to be dismissive of or very often outright antagonistic toward what they believed, how they lived, how they behaved as followers of Jesus Christ. So, we need to understand that we are being asked, to the extent that we are exiles, that we're being asked to create community with people who are hostile to who and what we are. In other words, this is not just an idea of loving people who are just like us, of Jesus followers loving other Jesus followers. This is an idea of creating community such that we are bringing in, drawing in other folks who are not necessarily Jesus followers and who, in fact, may be dismissive or, outside, or outright, outright hostile um, to who and what we are. So, being asked to create a community where we love everyone, not just other Jesus followers.
And then finally, verse 23, um, where we again encounter the idea of born again, of new life. And we see here that this is achieved through, quote, the living and enduring word of God. An idea which Peter then emphasizes by quoting from Isaiah 40. Here, we want to understand word, word of God, as Jesus. But we also want to understand it as obedience to a way of life. So word as um, the way we are to live and being obedient to that. So what this means is that we don't just receive new life through baptism, which is typically how we think about this, right? If we're putting off the old sinful life, taking on the new life, it's the idea of going, of a baptism, of going underwater, of dying to the old life, coming up out of the water, being born into this new life. But what First Peter is telling us is that that new life doesn't just happen through baptism. It also happens through how we live. This new life happens in large part through our obedience to the truth. To the extent to which we're creating proactively this community of love of loving all people, not because they are just like us, not just because they are Jesus followers, but loving them because whoever they are, they're children of God. We'll pick it up there next time. See you soon.